items in the pouch in front of you. Have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. In the early 1950s, Bob D'Arcy had just got back to California from playing in the Army Band, and he was looking for work. Fortunately, his father had just been hired at a place that needed someone to tour bigwigs and celebrities around, a still-under-construction Disneyland. From there, Bob became the very first tour guide ever at a Disney park, and spent his time showing Walt Disney's vision off to... Well, Walt Disney's friends. Bob chatted with me by phone, and while the quality of the call is, well, underwhelming, Bob's stories are absolutely incredible, as he remembers the time he drove a Jeep with Imagineer Harper Goff through the Jungle Cruise, yes, that's right, with the Jeep, fell in love and found himself a part of one of Disneyland's first scandals, and how years later, he ended up playing Adolf Hitler in The Rocketeer. All of that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. Bob DRC, welcome to DreamFinders. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So before we get into your time at Disneyland and writing your book, I'd like to chat a little bit about another creative talent of yours that's uh, jazz music. Um, you talk in the book about how your first celebrity tour at Disneyland uh, was Paul Whiteman, who was known as the King of Jazz in the 20s and 30s. And, uh, you know, you, you throughout the book talk about uh, the influence of jazz on your life. How did people like him and, uh, you know, fellow bandmate Bix Spiderbeck affect your taste in music at a young age? Well, actually, uh, uh, Paul Whiteman wasn't my first tour. He was one of them at the very beginning. But uh, being a jazz musician and going back in history, uh, Big Spiderback was the first really white musician that was really made a big name in jazz because, of course, jazz was really started by the, the black people. But uh, Paul Whiteman, of course, was very famous in the 20s. He had a huge orchestra, and uh, that's where I learned about Bix. And then I was to say, I was looking forward to talking with Paul, but we got to talk a little bit, but uh, sometimes uh, when I was going to have a tour schedule, sometimes I would get by the front gate and take off, and I'd have to go in the park and find him. And that's what happened to Paul Whiteman. But fortunately, I knew what he looked like, so I spotted him immediately. Mm. When did you first get into playing music? When when was uh, when did you start, uh, you know, tickling the ivories, as it were? Well, uh, when I was very young, in my, uh, of course, I'm talking around 1940, 44, 45, but Boogie Woogie was a very popular piano piece. In fact, it was... Uh, uh, in, almost as popular as popular music was, but it was strictly a piano. And that really got me uh, excited about it, because we had a piano in the house, and uh, then a friend of mine came over who played really good Boogie Boogie, and that really got me started in uh, wanting to really play the piano more and learn about, more about music. When you, um, uh, in the book you mention the Lighthouse Cafe and how you practically lived there for a time, which for those who don't know, was a major jazz joint uh, at the time. Miles Davis played there, Chet Baker, all these different people. Give us a sense of, for that sort of jazz nightlife at the time. What was a night like at the Lighthouse Cafe? Oh, the Lighthouse was a great part of my life because I had just graduated from high school and I enrolled in El Camino Junior High, in El Camino College. And uh, I met a friend of mine there who we were both playing trumpet in the marching band. And I never heard of the Lighthouse, but Timmy was his name, and he's the one who introduced me to the Lighthouse. And the first member I met at the band was uh, Howard Lindsay, who was the bass player and leader of the band. In fact, Howard made the whole Lighthouse go from the very beginning. And then eventually I met uh, all the members in the band, Shelley Mann and Jimmy Jufri, and uh, Frank Patchen, the great piano player, who was my first real music and piano teacher. And then the great Shorty Rogers, he was probably known more than anybody else on the whole West Coast. And to hear them play, that really got me interested in modern jazz music. Mm. So for all intents and purposes, music also sort of saved you in the Korean War. Is that correct? Yes, I was drafted in the Korean War. In fact, as my book states in there, uh, 
one night at the lighthouse, uh, Shorty, of course, Shorty and all those fellows in the band, I was very blessed because they kind of treated me like I was their kid brother. And knowing I was going to get drafted in the Korean War, Shorty came to me one night, I'll never forget this, and he said, Bob, you know, he said, you won't get in the band and play the piano. He said, you play a little trumpet. And I said, yeah, Shorty's very little. He said, doesn't matter. He said, you be up at the lighthouse every Saturday morning at 1030, and I'm going to get you a brush, a brush off course and get you ready so you can get the band in the army. Mm. And of course, thanks to Shorty, uh, and to our beautiful God, but thanks to Shorty, uh, that's how I got in the army band. So you end up in this army band in Alaska, which is certainly different than California. What was that culture shock like living in Alaska? Well, you know, uh, certainly I've been blessed in being able to be, uh, to, uh, you know, get in tune with things, so to speak. And, of course, the only 43rd army band up there was a bunch of great guys. So once you got used to the uh, weather, you know, because, and then, of course, used to how the time would change, I mean, uh, like at some in the, in the summertime, uh, the sun would come up around 10 in the morning. It wouldn't go down until about 2 or 3 in the, in the morning, the next morning. <laughs> and then it was reversed in, in the wintertime. Then it got, you know, it was longer days. But such a great band, a bunch of great guys that I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was glad I could serve my country that way as a bandsman. So you get home from the Army Band, and your father's already connected with the, what at the time you know, was known as the Disneyland Project because uh, it was still under construction in Anaheim. Um, what did your father do at the park when you when you first got back? I, he sort of had several jobs, especially uh, sort of shifted a little bit once the park opened uh, specifically. But when you got back, what was your father doing at the park? Well, uh, you know, the way, uh, as I mentioned in my book, uh, Dad always wrote me some nice letters when I was in the service. And the last one, about a month before be, uh, to go be rotated and get discharged, uh, he told that's the first time I ever heard the word Disneyland. Walt hired him to be his food and restaurant man for, for the planning and development of Disneyland. That's the first time I ever heard that word. Because my father had uh, was always in a restaurant business, and he formed the Driving and Restaurant Owners Association of Southern California. And that's what attracted Walt when he uh, hired Dad, because... He wanted somebody with a lot of experience in that. So an interesting fact, and this might be one of my favorite Walt Disney facts of all time, uh, is that technically Walt Disney saved your father's foot. Is that correct? That's correct. Says that, uh, see, Disney Studios across the street is uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. And uh, Walt's private doctor was there, a fellow by the name of Danny Fortman. And uh, Walt was concerned about Dad's foot because he was being treated by a doctor, but not a good one. So Walt sent him over to his doctor right away because gangrene was forming in my father's foot. Mm. And uh, so Walt actually saved my dad's foot. So when I got back from the army, my mother didn't drive. My grandmother brothers were still in school. So I became Dad's driver, so to speak. Now, you're... Uh, experience with the Disneyland Park is it, in, it, your father worked there and you worked there, but it was sort of a family affair. The, you know, there are several of your family members at some point that worked at the park. What did everyone do? Well, you know, uh, first of all, uh, naturally it was me, and then uh, my sister. Uh, and at that time, when the park was brand new, the Coronation Ice Cream Park there was a big space in between that and the the next building, and uh, she had her own flower display and sold flowers. And my youngest brother, Jim, who was just a, oh, he's about a, maybe 10 or something, and uh, he was Disneyland's first little paper boy. He did, he did that just during the summer when he was not in school. And then my brother, Ron, was a light operator. And, uh, well, uh, you know, the whole Diazzi family was there. <laughs> Yeah, it was definitely a family affair. So you met Walt even before you were hired, thanks to your dad, uh, because you were taking him to the parks and those sort of things. Um, I feel like it's a question most likely uh, asked, you know, but uh, it's always interesting. What was he like? What was it like meeting Walt Disney for the first time? Well, you know, when I, as I say, at the very beginning, uh, when I first got home from there and I started taking Dad to the studio, well, uh, I'd never been to the studio before, especially coming out of the army. My like, gosh, this was something. So anyway, I uh, one day when I drove that in, I said, you know, I want to go to the, the, the studio and see what's all happening and everything. So as I said, my book, I won't go into more that much, but seeing the whole studio the way it was was really interesting to me. 
So when I came back from this long tour of my own, came back to Dad's office, and there was Walt. And he and Dad were discussing some kind of business, so I waited outside. And uh, Dad said, come on in, son, and meet Walt. So I did, and went met Walt, and uh, I said, you know, nice to meet you. He said, nice to meet you, Bob. He said, he, you know, he had to leave because his, dad, uh, his business was finished with Dad. So I, it was just a very brief meeting when I first met him, but boy, it was very magnetic. So run us through a normal day uh, for you before the park opens. You're, you're helping out on the lot. Um, you know, construction's happening all over the place. But what are you up to? What, what do you do to fill the day while your dad's also working? Well, uh, Walt hired me to work in the project engineer's office, a fellow by the name of Lou Roth. He was a real great guy. So my very first uh, job at Disneyland, of course, I'm talking six months before it opened now, mm-hmm. was to receive uh, the blueprints from the studio, the plans, and I would file one in our office, and one in landscaping, and one to uh, construction. And once I did that, whatever Walt, uh, Lou needed me to do, which was, wasn't too much, but uh, I would get in a cheap and uh, Wall Street and take my tour around the whole park, because at 4.30, it was very magical. At 4.30 every, every day, all the work stopped. All the electricians, carpenters, they were all through with their work, and they left, and the park was totally empty, except for me, Lou, and my father. But it was a perfect time for me to get Wolf's Jeep and tour the park, and I took all my uh, color slide pictures of the whole thing being built. Let me ask you about the, all those photos. Uh, had, had you always been someone who was interested in photography, or, or was this something special that you felt you had to document? Well, I've always liked photography. And when I was in the Army, uh, Kodak Signet came out, a very nice camera, and it was, uh, I only took slide pictures. I didn't take any printed pictures. But uh, I, you know, I just really enjoyed so much taking all the pictures and seeing the whole thing, being a creative person myself, to see all this slowly coming into, you know, to the, actually to the 17th, which was the, uh, television pre- premiere, the television premiere of Disneyland. Mm-hmm. But before that, a lot of times I would just walk the whole park and see everything happening. It was really magical for me. You also do odds and ends uh, around the park around this time. Uh, tell us about how you were probably one of the few people to take the Jungle Cruise by car. You and Hopper Goff uh, had a uh, you and Hopper Goff had a real interesting project with the Jungle uh, the Jungle Jeep, uh, as you call it in the book. Yes, uh, Harper Golf is a real nice show. I met him at the studio just once, but uh, when he took course, as I say, he was the uh, art director of Adventureland, and so I was in Lou's office one morning, and Lou said, uh, Harper Golf needs you in Adventureland. So as I, I went over there, and uh, there he was, and he had Walt's Jeep with a uh, all two by four construction over it, which was the same size that the boats would be on the ridge on the ride when the park opened. And so uh, Harper Gardner said, Bob, I really need your help. He said, get in your Jeep. And he said, we're going to lay the post for where the, uh, we're going to lay the stakes for where the post would be that are going to support the rail that the boats would ride on. Because a lot of people thought the boat was just, you know, free running, but it was all on the track, or the rail, so to speak. So I did that. So I get in the, in the car and I started in the Jeep. I started running and uh, Harper said, stop. And I stopped, and he put a stake in. So anyway, we staked the whole ride. <laughs> and so eventually, of course, when the construction came in and put the rail in, uh, all the work we did with the stakes was already there. So it was just interesting to me to work with Harper, you know, in this little park as part of the construction of Disneyland. So by the time the park opens, you are officially working in guest relations for the park. I think a lot has been written and discussed about sort of the chaos of the opening of Disneyland. Um, And in your book, you don't deny that it was busy, but it doesn't seem like the madhouse that I think some people portray it as. What was opening day like for you? Well, you see, opening day, again, you've got to realize, uh, Nathan, that the park was so clear then. There was no obstructions of anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like today, I'm not putting that Disneyland down today, but when I was there this last February, it was so massive and there was so much stuff in there and everything. Sometimes I didn't even know where it was. <laughs> but opening day, 
you know, it was so clear and clean that uh, uh, it was tours and everything were, were so much easier to do because, you know, like I say, being brand new and uh, having that option of no obstructions or anything. And so it took a lot of very interesting people to do. At the very beginning, uh, I, you know, I was the only tour guide there. And then uh, as my uh, that publisher, who you knew, David, mm-hmm. he looked up and found out that they didn't start any kind of a, uh, a tour guide thing until a c- couple of years after I left. But that was for the public. They could order a tour guide for their little party or whatever. But in my day, the uh, public was not involved at all. I took nothing but, oh, I took Walt's kid's friends from his childhood days in Kansas. I took some of his uh, producers and some of his close friends and... I took government officials from the uh, United States government as well as the California government. And movie star, oh, it just went on and on. I, everybody in the park was kind of envious of me because I realized what a great job I really had. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You discuss in the book, though, as much as a great job you did, you did also get into some hijinks along the way. Uh, and one of my favorite stories from the book, gosh, one of my favorite stories I think of all time uh, when it comes to Disneyland is a little party that you held in Walt Disney's own apartment. Would you tell us a little bit about that story? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a fun memory. I, have. I mean, Walt was such a wonderful person to me. I mean, uh, anyway, uh, what happened was uh, Walt and all the executives were up northern California for the Winter Olympics in that year, getting that all prepared. So uh, I had hired one fellow to help me out in my department to help me because I had a lot of work. But his name was John Miller, and John Miller was a brother of Ron Miller, who was married to Walt Disney's daughter, Diane. So this Sunday, everybody was gone. The park was kind of slow. And um, so we're sitting in my office, and he said, you know, to break boredom, why don't we go up to Walt's apartment, you know, just sit up there for a while. So I said, yeah. So I got the key from Kay and, and, and up to the apartment we went, and we walked in. And when you first walked into Walt's apartment, Immediately on the right was a big liquor cabinet, kind of formed kind of a little hallway. And once you got past that, you turned right into his beautiful apartment. So we went up there and we're sitting there. And so John said, well, we should have a drink. I said, I don't have a key to the liquor cabinet. He said, who needs the key? He was kind of a renegade. So he popped open the lock and opened the liquor cabinet. Of course, we poured ourselves a drink. I thought at the time, ooh, maybe we're getting out of line here. But for some reason... Uh, we felt okay about it, so we had another drink, so we bent all of a sudden. See, before John came with me, he was a ride operator on different rides, so he knew a lot of the gals there. So he invited, well, there was about 10 gals invited up to the party. So we were partying until around 11 o'clock at night and having a great time. And uh, then, at that time, the girls cleaned everything up, so everything was pristine. So the next morning, I come in to work and have kind of a hangover. And John hadn't come into work yet. So Barbara, my lovely secretary, she said, Dolores has been calling you. And I said, I know. That was Walt's private secretary at that time. Dolores felt and she was a nice lady. So anyway, I started packing up my desk. I said, you know, it's pink slip time. I'm out of here. <laughs> so the phone rings, and Barbara says, it's Dolores for you. So I said, I know Dolores. I'm packing up. She said, no, no, don't do that. She said, of course, the whole park and everybody knew about you. This was this party in Walt's apartment. So I had to tell him. So she said, I walked in, and she said, uh, well, seems like Bob D'Arcy and John Miller had quite a party in your apartment last night, two wee hours. He said, oh, really? He said, uh, was it anything destroyed or wrecked or anything? She said, no, you never, never knew anybody was up there. And he said, hats off to him. They got a lot of guts out of that. <laughs> and he never once ever mentioned it to me in all the times he passed my office. <laughs> it's such a That's crazy a story. It was beautiful. Oh, man. Something that is surprising, though, about your book, um, because we've had books about the history of Disneyland, and we've had books with hijinks in them and all sorts, and in fact, uh, your publisher has uh, authored some of those. Um, But the one thing that I've never read in a Disneyland oral history is uh, a bittersweet love story, Uh, and your book certainly has one. Tell us a little bit about Judy Marsh. Well, I could spend all day. <laughs> but I'll tell you, basically, she was a, a very beautiful woman, but a great singer. I mean, that's why she was there. And uh, at the very beginning, when the park was just 
fact, before opening day, I popped in there to the Golden Horseshoe, and they were in rehearsal. That's when I first saw Judy, and I was not alone, because almost every guy in the park was that you know, was attracted to her because she was so beautiful, and a very soulful singer. And so, I watched the rehearsal, and then, pretty soon, when I started getting uh, tours with some uh, important people, I used to always order uh, a box on stage left. So, I began there so that my guests, whoever I took to, could really see the show from, you know, from a different angle. So, during the show, at the beginning, uh, Judy knew what my job was. They all did, knew in the band. Matt Patterson and the grandma, we became great friends. But, but they all knew if I was in that box, it was somebody special. So, Judy would come over during her, one of her, her songs and teens and give a little bow to us, you know, to acknowledge us. And then she'd go on with her routine. And then, little did I know, but Mel Patterson, the drummer, had became friends with Judy. And uh, she evidently was attracted to me because I was taking the great actress uh, through, uh, I'll think of her name in a second, but anyway, I was with her and her friends, and of course, we're sitting in that uh, box. And so this time, Judy came over, and instead of giving a little bow, she looked at me and said, hello there. <laughs> and boy, that, that really shook me up a little bit. Teresa Wright was a great actress's name I'm speaking of. And so she looked at me and she said, Bob, I think she likes you. And I said, yeah, sure, me, I'm, I'm lost in line. Everybody in this park is after her. <laughs> she said, no, I think she likes you. So it wasn't long after that. I had been going over to Melanon's for, for uh, dinners once in a while. Actually, I know it was a great drummer in, in, in the trio. The, there was a trio. There was a drummer, a trumpet player, and a piano player made up the music group for the show. So then, out of the blue, one day, Mel said, you know, Anna's cooking up something special on Saturday night. She wants you to make it if you can. And I said, I'd love to make it. Sure, I'll be there. So I went over, and of course, this was all planned for me. Open the door, and there was Judy and Mel and Anne. And I blew my mind to see Judy like that. And we started connecting right there real good. And uh, we had a wonderful love affair, a wonderful friendship. Uh, it was a whole combination of everything. But uh, Judy was a, oh, boy, she was a sweetheart. I still love her to this day. She was just, and I thought, you know, because, see, Judy came from Hollywood, and she'd been on the road with a couple of bands, so she'd been around the, the block a few times. And, you know, I I thought, well, you know, I don't know how this is going to work out, because I was not that way. But she was not only a beautiful lady, but she was a homebody. I thought at the time, oh, man, I don't have enough money to take her out to dinners and clubs and all this. She wanted nothing of that. She was strictly a homebody, and we had more great fun listening to music and talking and developing, uh, developing our friendship and our love ship. And that was one of the highlights of the part for me. And it's, it's obviously just about any guy would say that. I would say so. Now, sadly, though, of course, this is a bittersweet love story. And uh, one of the reasons for that is because she ends up getting fired wrongfully, of course, in my opinion, uh, for being part of what is uh, what you call in the book Disneyland's first scandal. Um, give us a little bit of what yeah. happened and and uh, and why you think Walt made the decisions that he did. Well, what really happened was everything was going along just fine. But before I started going with Judy and selling up with her, she went with some guy a couple of years ago who was one of those guys that didn't want to let her go. And he bugged her. And so what happened was, when he found out, of course, that Judy was at Disneyland and a big star there, and that she had another love affair, another, another lover. So what he did was he came out there, he found out, I don't know how he found this out, but he found out Judy rented a kind of a nice house right near the park. So he broke into the house, and he decided to uh, commit the, uh, commit suicide. So he turned on all the gas burners, and of course, like a lot of dumb people, wanted to have his last cigarette. Well, he lit the, the, the cigarette and ignited part of the house. Not a great, didn't burn it down or anything, but it started a fire, and his clothes caught on fire. And he ran outside, well, of course, attracted all the neighbors. Of course, they called the fire department, the police, the whole thing. So everybody knew something big happened to Judy. And poor Judy, she had nothing to do with it. This jerk did it. He ruined the whole thing. But anyway, it became a thing in the papers. And as I say, it was just an really first scandal. 
And poor Judy was really upset because Walt loved the show. Whenever he came to the park, he caught the golden horseshoe. He loved it, and he loved Judy. But this happened, and of course, at that time, you know, Disneyland was very super clean image, different today. But then it was super clean, so Walt called her out to the studio, and he had a nice talk with her. He was very sad. He said, I'm sorry, Judy, but this is such a, 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 a thing with this, the Disney image and everything, and all the publicity people are telling me that. He said, unfortunately, I have to let you go, Judy. I hate you, but I have to let you go. Well, she came home that night. She was very upset, of course, obviously, because she loved Disneyland. She loved Walt. She loved the whole park, the show, everybody. And all of a sudden, my poor Judy, her whole life just got flipped upside down. So she had to go back to Hollywood and start, you know, find work again. Mm -hmm. And she moved back and lived with her mother. And uh, so that kind of messed up our, uh, our relationship because I only had one day off. And to drive there to, to town and back was too much. So we slowly had to part company. But Judy was felt awful bad because she loved the part and loved the show. Was it hard uh, to, to disagree with Walt, a man who you, you had come to respect? Clearly, you don't agree with what he, the choice that he made. It, was, that a, was that a difficult moment for you when it, when it came to seeing him as a, uh, sort of the leader and the man that you had known him to be? Uh, well, you know, as far as Walt goes, see, my father told me at the very beginning of my book when Dad and I were writing out to the park, uh, he said, there's things about Walt. First of all, before that, uh, there was an argument between Walt and C.G. Wood at the beginning of the book anyway. Mm -hmm. So Walt told, uh, Dad told me, he said, you know, when you deal with Walt, don't call him Mr. Disney. He hates that. And don't try to get in his pocket. Don't try to be, you know, hi, hi, Walt, I'm working for you, and this and all that kind of stuff. And he said, don't be a snitcher. I guess you know what that word mm -hmm. means. So anyway, um, my dealings with Walt, I mean, uh, were just, you know, I didn't have long conversations with him or anything, but I had a lot of nice encounters with him. And in spite of the things that I did, uh, I think he just really took a liking to me. In fact, that's... One of the clashes I had with Tommy Walker, who was uh, the head of guest relations at that time and customer relations. But as far as my connection with Walt, everything was just one. I mean, he never, ever, again, with the apartment, with the, with the party and everything, mm -hmm. he never said a word to me. He always called me kid. And he said, kid, you're doing a good job or whatever. So my association with Walt was absolutely beautiful because I did my job and he liked me and I got to be with him in certain like when we dedicated the sky ride and it was in his private, you know, and at, and at that time, at the end of Main Street on the right was the uh, Swiss Red Wagon, the biggest restaurant at the park at that time. And that's the private dining room was in there. So we had to, uh, when we had the Swiss consulate there, because we dedicated the sky ride, I sat right next to Walt, this private apartment during the uh, whole function with the Swiss consulate. So if you ask me about Walt, I would say he was almost like my uncle. Hmm. So after Judy leaves, uh, you don't stay around much longer. Was it, was it simply time for a new adventure, or did you just was was it just not the park that you wanted to be at anymore? Was it just a different light since Judy had left? Well, that plus the fact that Tommy Walker. See, Tommy did a couple of things. Walt was not that happy with Tommy, but since Tommy came from SC and recommended by Walt son in law. That's why he had the job there in that position. And I think down deep, you know, because, you know, uh, Nathan, I don't have a big fat ego. I'm not one of those kind of guys. But uh, I think he was kind of jealous of me because Walt did like me. And Walt, as I say, he had a couple of uh, encounters with him he didn't like. And, of course, later on in, develop in purchasing the land for Walt Disney World, Tommy pulled a real terrible number on us. It was terrible. But... Uh, the fact was, see, he tried to demote me because I was dressed sharp because my father taught me that because I'm representing Walt Disney in Disneyland and all the ride operators, the, uh, the, the supervisors, they're all dressed in their own clothes so they're not the operator, you know, like they had uniforms. So that one day, Tommy called me in his eyes, trying to demote me. He said, you know, I think you should wear a uniform just like this. But by that time, I had a hostess and a couple of hostesses and they had their own uniforms. He said, I think you should be in a uniform, too. It makes the apartment look a little more together. I said, Tommy, I don't wear white uniforms. 
and I'm proud of the way I dress, and so was Walt and so forth. He said, I don't think about that. So it wasn't after that that he started doing little things to me to kind of agitate me. So I, I said, okay. So that's when I gave my, when I think they gave my two year, two week notice, and that's when I left his thing there. I really didn't want to, but I couldn't put up with him anymore. It was just too much. So you, you uh, start uh, going off to new adventures, uh, and one of those adventures is being a stand-in and a study double uh, for television. How did you get into that? And explain to those who don't know what that job is, what a stand-in does for Hollywood. Well, what happened was, see, my Uncle Harry was very loved in the motion picture industry. He was Jack Webb's original drag dragon. Uh, my Uncle Harry was Jack Webb's assistant director and, and production manager. And so I gave Uncle Harry a tour at the park, and he told me, he said, Bob, you know, things, you know, don't work out here. He said, look me up, because I think you could make a nice uh, career in the movie industry, which inter interested me then, you know, but I was so hung up in my music career, I didn't think much about it until later on after I was married. And then, you know, I, didn't, I had great music connections, but I wasn't studied enough. I didn't get to really study music to get to that level of the people I'm talking about, like Shorty Rogers and all those great people. So I looked up my Uncle Harry, and he was a wonderful man. And uh, he told me about the business. He wanted me to start out to be a, a script supervisor. And that's the job a person has in the movie business that holds the script and puts in there which takes are the ones to be printed and the ones that are not to be printed. Anyway, I didn't get to do that job because a very unfortunate thing happened. My dear father, who I loved so very much, he and my Uncle Harry died a day apart. Mm. And they wound up at the same mortuary in the valley. And it was quite confusing there. But anyway, so I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Well, his son, my cousin Bill D.R.C., had just got, uh, became assistant director. And through a friend of my father's, I got, oh, I was so blessed with this, Nathan, because sent me over to the Screen Extras Guild, and a fellow named like Cesar Sortino was running it, and he got to, to work extra in those days. You had to be accepted by um, central casting, and you couldn't get into central casting unless you had some kind of a name. So this fellow that was running the Screen Extras Guild, he set up for me, and that's how I got into business to start with. And I chose to be a stand-in because... Uh, I like working with the crew, with the actors, with the directors, but not only that, but it was much more steady work in the business to be a stand-in, because I had a family and three children, so I needed steady work, so that's why I chose to be a stand-in, and it's... Boy, you talk about an interesting job. It was, if you think of, of a totem pole, the structure of a movie company at that time, at the very top, of course, is a producer, and then the writers, and then the cast, and then the directors, and the, the head of the, the director of photography. And then you've got the crew, electrician, so forth, props, and wait, you know, everybody. The bottom is the stand-in, <laughs> because he doesn't contribute anything as far as anything, you know, to the creative part of the, of the business. But he's very well needed, because on the set, when the, when the actors do their rehearsal, and they get basic marks with the camera and the director and so forth. Well, after they do that rehearsal, they have to go to makeup or work or whatever, so they're gone. So second team, us, they're known as the first team. Second team is us, so we go in. You don't have to be an actor or anything, but you have to do, make the moves just like the rehearsal because the whole crew likes you. So you're being lit, the whole thing, and so once your job is over, crew is ready, and they say, okay, then... Then comes the first team, and they do their thing, because the whole thing is all probably lit, and they do that, and then to print, we move on to the next set. So a standing job is really something, because I saved some careers. I, oh, I did, see, it, the standing was kind of a pivotal job. It could be used at, at different you know departments and things just to help out. So my 30 years in the business was really wonderful, because I had a a great time, worked with a lot of great people, a lot of great directors, and a lot of great actors. And that's the thing, as I say, I loved about the job, because you worked with a crew. I love working with the crew. And then, you know, of course, on Gilligan's Island, Bob Dendro was a dear friend of mine. I met him before that, when he was working on The Many Loves of Toby Gillis, 
that's how we met. Mm. And then uh, later on, I hooked with the great art actor Martin Sheen. I was with Martin for about 10 years and uh, traveled with him and everything. So when I'm getting at the stand-ins, they could become a very interesting job other than just hitting the mark, so to speak. What uh, film work or television work did you do with Martin Sheen? I'm curious. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we worked on a... Uh, he was just came out from Broadway to Hollywood. He was brand new. And there was a series called The Rookies about uh, Los Angeles policemen when they first started out as rookies. So there was one scene I worked... A friend, uh, my assistant director, she used to hire me to do extra work, too. I wasn't standing in at this time. I was just doing extra work. Well, the scene was... There was uh, a, a lot of drug addicts who were taking methadone, you know, to get off drugs. Mm-hmm. So the scene was, uh, there was a line of guys waiting at this big counter to get this methadone. So there was, a, there was a, one actor in front, then another guy, and then Marty was behind him. And I was right behind Marty. We had never met before. And so uh, during the rehearsal, he was supposed to come up to get his methadone, like everybody else, in line. Well, then in rehearsal, I went right in front, because I knew some of the crews. I went right in front of them and threw the whole thing off. He said, what are you doing? I said, I've got a worse habit than you have. I've got to have my pop right now. Well, he cracked up. <laughs> he laughed, and the director all laughed about that. So that's how we met. So uh, he said, yeah, I, I said, where are you from? So I found out he was just from New York. So I, I, he said, how can we work together? I said, I'm basically a stand-in. I told him what it was. He said, how can we work together? I said, well, the next show you get, request me to the assistant director, request me that you you have your own standard. And that, that was common to do in the business at that time. So he got me on the very first show we worked on, and it was a thing called uh, letters. It was about letters that had been sent years ago that got messed up in the post office somehow. And those letters are finally delivered to the person they were meant to be. Well, it's all about that life, how it changed from that letter and everything. So that was the first show we did together. And then after that, oh, we did some wonderful movie of the weeks. And, uh, and we did some big projects called um, uh, The Missions of October. That was all about the uh, Russian, you know, the Cold War, almost mm-hmm. going to be in Cuba. And we did uh, Pretty Boys Lord. I said the story of him, that great old gangster from the past. And we did, uh, oh gosh, I can't uh, go sit on and on. I'll think of some more later, but, uh, I did a lot, we did a lot of movies of the week, which were a big thing in television at that time. Hmm. And then, you know, we never got to do any feature movies together, but we did an awful lot of big television things because Marty wanted to really get into the, uh, as I say, the, uh, uh, making feature movies at that time because at that time television was just getting started and feature movie that was the king of all and television was well you know that's for those guys that didn't quite make it into the big movie industry but Marty was really terrific a great actor and as I say we did many things together and uh, Brand Ambition was another one that was a big story about the Nixon and the Watergate and the whole thing mm. and he played John Dean who was the uh, consul at that time to Nixon so we traveled to, back to Washington with him, and, and we went to New York together. And anyway, I traveled a lot with Marty, and we had a wonderful wonderful uh, time together for about 10 years, as I say. Mm. Now, your final film appearance uh, brings things a bit uh, back around, because it is for Disney's own The Rocketeer, uh, a personal favorite of mine, a, a great love. Um, but you also have a rather unique role in the film, don't you? Well, the Rockets here, well, you know, that's very interesting because well, I did a couple of book signings over the weekend, and uh, it was so interesting how things worked out. So I started my career basically with Disneyland, naturally. That was my first dip in the show business, so to speak. And then at the very end of my career, uh, I was well, the Rocketeer. I got a call to be uh, the director picked me out of a bunch of book at casting to play a fly cook. Because the Rocketeer takes place in 1939, just before the war started. And so I went out to the set with Indian Dunes, where my dear friend Vic Moore got killed, the same uh, location. But I went out there, and uh, Michelle, that's a dear friend of mine, who was a, uh, used to be a secretary to one of my favorite producers, but Michelle became an assistant director. So I get to the set and I'm talking with Michelle, and all of a sudden this guy comes up to me, 
I don't know who he is, but he's circling me. And uh, so Michelle, no, Bob, she says, you got to meet Joe Johnson. He's the director of this. And he, and he said, Bob, I didn't mean to be rude like that, but he said, ever since I took on this project, something that's been bugging me forever is somebody to portray Hitler. He said, would you mind, at the end of the day's work, to go up to wardrobe, put on uh, the, the dress hat and the mustache, and, and, do, and I said, no, I'd be happy to do it. He said, would you be offended? doing his but I said, no, this is a business. Uh, you know, it doesn't affect me any. So anyway, at the end of the day, to go up there, of course, I had a lot of buddies on the crew. So they all were lined up with me, and they put on black electrical tape massages like here, they're just for a gag. There was about five or six of them standing there with me. So anyway, he came up to me, he said, Bob, he said, I really appreciate if you would do this, because this has been one of the sticklers. I said, I'd be happy to. So it was shot at San Marino at a little airport on the on the coast, and uh, of course it was all dressed up to be like the thirties and that thirty nine during the uh, beginning of the war. So I went to wardrobe and the whole thing. When I came out, Nathan in that outfit, I looked in the mirror. I couldn't believe myself how much I looked like him. Yeah. So I came out. I dressed up because I had to walk. Of course, when you go to shoot a movie in any small town, all the locals come there to see you know what's going on. So I must have stopped about five or six times to sign up autographs for people <laughs> because they, I couldn't get over the hit then anyway. So when I got to the set to get the approval from uh, Joe Johnson, the director, he said, oh, my gosh, Bob, perfect. And so I did. Uh, I spent about a day doing the scenes that he had, you know, in the script. And unfortunately, he told me, he wrote me a nice letter, and he said, unfortunately, being a new director, I don't really have the power to keep stuff that I want in. That's up to the producers. They make their own cuts, what they want. And he said, There's, he said, I could have shot you a foot away from you and would have been look, looked exactly like him. He said, I'm just sorry. There wasn't more in, in, the, in the movie itself. So when you see the movie, it's probably only maybe two or three or four seconds or something. Because they cut a lot out. That's, you know, the producers, they think other things are more important. That's the way the business works, so I understood that. But that was why I ended my career with Disney. It started with Disney and ended with Disney. And a fairly great career it was. And, and of course, you, uh, we've, as we've mentioned throughout all of this, uh, you wrote all of this down in your book, A Walk in the Park. Um, how did the creation of that book come about? When did you decide you wanted to make sure this was written out for uh, other generations to read? Well, you know, I, again, uh, how this all started, I have to thank my partner, Dale, here that uh, put my uh, name on Facebook, give me a Facebook page. That's how David got connected with us. But uh, uh, writing my stories, like I say, I I just wrote it as it was. I don't, you know, I don't claim to be a big writer or anything. It's I would be in the category of memoir, so to speak. But uh, I just wrote it as it was, and I hope, you know, that kids could understand it and enjoy it, too. As you look back, uh, and and you wrote uh, as you were writing the book, I'm curious uh, if you found uh, some aspect of Disney that you missed the most, um, and and if you could go back at that time, you would do more of or enjoy more of. Well, you know, I I just miss uh, that probably that I would like to spend more time with Walt, but uh, actually my whole experience there, uh, as I say, Nathan was is so magical to me because you know when you're younger. You're into something, and you don't realize how really great it was till many, many years later. And speaking for myself, because when I was at Disneyland, involved in it and everything, I knew I was in something great. But never thought about what Disneyland would become such a huge, huge uh, market, and so many, uh, you know, followers. Are... So it was, as I say, I, I enjoyed the whole thing, and it was, uh, it was a marvelous experience for me. So, Bob, finishing up here, I thought we would end with a fun question. Uh, is If there is someone out there uh, who uh, doesn't like jazz, you as someone who does, what album or artist should they give a try? Well, you know, I was very blessed too, Nathan, because during my Lighthouse days, there was a great piano player, a black fellow by the name of Hampton Hawes. And Hampton was a natural player. I mean, he was a genius. He was very well respected in the business. And uh, Hamper and I became friends, and uh, in fact, he encouraged me a lot to play. And uh, that, uh, Hampton Hawes, and of course, the White House 
then they'd start making their own records. At that time, before I got drafted, I even sold records in the White House, the very first records that came out. So if people really want to know about that era of jazz, look up Hampton Hawes in the White House All-Stars. And, uh, oh, there's so many great. Pete Jolly was another great piano player I studied with. And I met so many of them. But uh, the White House game was really my start very beginning, and that's where I say I met the great Hampton Hawes. In fact, in those days, Oscar Peterson was a huge name, because in those jazz, days, jazz was doing so great, it was becoming popular and everything. And wherever Hap went to play, there was, a, on the road, there was, when he got to the club, there was always a telegram from Oscar Peterson, which was great. Yeah. So Hap was very well respected, and unfortunately, he died too young. Well, Bob D.R.C., thank you so very much for coming on DreamFinders. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Nice talking with you, Nathan. And that's it for this episode of DreamFinders. It was amazing to hear Bob D'Arcy's stories, and I can't thank him enough for being on the show. Make sure to pick up his book, A Walk in the Park, Reflections from Disneyland's First Host, which is available on Amazon. A special thanks to Lucio Figueroa for cleaning up the quality of Bob's call. I really appreciate it. DreamFinders is edited by Shannon Mickelson. It's hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Our podcast artwork is provided by J.P. Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the worldwide leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at wdwnt.com. Tell your friends about the show, and please, please, please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It means a lot. Also, if you or someone else you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. DreamFinders is sponsored by Never Grow Up Vacations, the official travel partner of WDWNT.com. Never Grow Up Vacations specializes in trips to Disney destinations around the world. So be like us and never grow up. Head over to NeverGrowUpVacations.com to book your next trip today.